the Honorable the Leader of the Opposition. Madam Speaker, Honorable President and Deputy President, Honorable Members of this House, Fellow South Africans, Bakhaitsu, Dumela. Indeed, at this very moment, a child is born in this country. That child will be born in a modern, high-tech hospital, most likely in a hospital that has a 3D scan. She will be surrounded by both her parents there. That same child will soon be taken home in a place that will be protected by private security. She'll later attend a school with teachers who are present all the time. And ultimately, she will be one of the few who will learn how to code and have opportunity. That child will get through university and ultimately will have a career that stretches out before her. Of course, she'll have to work hard, but you can be guaranteed that in fact her future will always be there if she chooses to exercise that opportunity. But fellow South Africans, at the same time as all of that, there will be another child. Or, that will be a child who will grow up in a community gripped by fear. She'll have no choice but to go to the school nearest to her. And she will know that even when she goes to school, there may not be teachers in that classroom. She will know that when she goes to that school, she will walk for kilometers if she's in a rural community. Maybe, maybe it might happen that she'll finish school. Maybe it might happen that she might get a degree. Maybe it might happen, but in truth, many of us are starting to know if she's not the one of the lucky ones, she's unlikely to work. She's unlikely to find a job. Fellow South Africans, this is the South Africa that we live in. This is our country. We live in two separate worlds. When we speak about inequality, it's not just a question of income inequality. It's an inequality of opportunity. It's an inequality of dreams. It's an inequality of possibilities. We live in a country of outsiders and insiders. And right now, we are making no headway in breaking down that wall between those who have and those who have not. And the tragedy is that on Thursday, the president in the evening gave a vision of a future of South Africa with high-tech cities, high-speed trains, and classrooms where children are taught to code and analyze data and no child goes hungry. Mr. President, I get that. My greatest fear is simply this, is that that will only be available to a few of our children and many of our kids in this country who will be left out of opportunity in our nation. It cannot be a South Africa for some and not a South Africa for all. And that's why in the DA we have a dream motivated by building one South Africa for all. Honorable members, the stats released last month paint a very dire picture. It's a picture of a record unemployment that now stands at 38%. It's a picture where our economy contracted by 3.2% and ultimately that shows that our investment is declining. If you read that picture, you can see our country is in crisis. It's a crisis that we need to face head on. Our priority must be to fix what is broken in South Africa and to build a South Africa where we can be guaranteed an equality of opportunity. The party of an equal shot, not an equal outcome. So to do that, we must and we must table reforms. We need a bold plan. 
We need the right budget, we need the right people, and most importantly, we need a plan. We need to stop debating the mandate of the Reserve Bank. It's already in the Constitution. What we need to do is get on with the business of doing. So, Mr. President, while you are looking to build smart cities, I want to say, why don't we make the cities that we have already smart? Why don't we broaden access and connect young people to information and opportunities that remain available to a few? At one place to start, Mr. President, is with the allocation of the broad spectrum. We will not reduce data costs until that decision is settled. So, Mr. President, furthermore, instead of building a new bullet, bullet train, let's rather fix and protect the trains we have and give them to provinces to run. We need interventions that will ultimately ensure we have unemployment in our lifetime and make sure that, in fact, we give young people a national civilian service where they can work. Let me tell you something. By the end of the 19th century, a city like New York and, and London were facing a crisis that seemed to have no solution. As these cities grew and developed, the thousands and thousands of horses needed to transport people around had left streets knee-deep in manure. New York had to employ an army of workers to clear the streets every day in London. The Times newspaper reported back in 1894 that every street in the city would be buried under nine feet of manure within 50 years. Of course, this didn't happen. And the reason for that was because there was a bold new solution. It's that instead of us having horses, let's rather make cars. Henry Ford's new and affordable motor car replaced horses in the cities. The manure problem went away. And of course, history changed forever. If we want to challenge the issues that we face today, we cannot be giving solutions that give us faster horses. What we need is bold new interventions that trade, that transition South Africa. All the president wanted to give us on Thursday is a faster horse. We need a plan and we need one now urgently towards a South Africa of a future. And this plan must respond to these three challenges, Mr. President. It must respond to what we're going to do around climate, what are we going to do around technology, and what are we going to do around disease management? So, we must ask ourselves these simple questions. What kind of South Africa do we want our children to inherit? What kind of skills do we need to help them with to step into the future? And can we make sure our population and our cities are resilient? These are questions we need to have. We no longer have the luxury of talking about climate. The fact of the matter is that even during these elections, we saw floods in KZN and a drought here in the Western Cape. So in truth, if we don't attend to this question and build cities that are resilient, it doesn't matter who's in government, South Africa will face difficult days ahead. Furthermore, elsewhere in the country, people are already responding to technology. We are using solutions like smart, smart phone screening to detect cervical cancer. This must be something we include as part of our plans in rural healthcare. I hear everybody speaking about the fourth industrial revolution. Fellow South Africans, giving tablets to our children is not the fourth industrial revolution. That's the third industrial revolution. We should be preparing our kids for jobs that don't, all, or that don't exist. That's the job now. And so the overwhelming majority of our jobs are not going to come from mining or manufacturing. They're going to come from fields such as data mining, digital design, coding, and a host of technology-driven micro-enterprises. We need a plan that modernizes our economy for the future. Because let's learn this simple lesson. I grew up with Kodak. I grew up with things like Nokia. But in truth, if you look around this room, nobody uses Nokia phones, and nobody is worried about Kodak. The world has changed. If we don't change with it, learn the lesson from multi-choice. All of these companies had a monopoly on the world, but because of the changes that are taking place, we're rendered obsolete. The point simply is this. If we don't adapt now and change to the world that is upon us, we will fall behind and our people will continue to be unemployed. 
Mr. President, our vision for South Africa is a South Africa for all, in which every child has access to education, a modernized economy that puts at least a job in every home, that gives access to health care and basic services to all, where services, where citizens live in safe communities free from crime and corruption, a South Africa that is reconciled, a prosperous one, and a beacon of hope for the developing world. That's only the first part. The second part is actually that we must table a plan. We must figure out a way as to how do we get there from where we are. And therefore, inevitably, we have to make hard decisions. It can't be business as usual. We have to make the tough choices about standing up to unions and alliance partners. We have to actually upset the network of patronage that has kept so many of the cadres in jobs for far too long despite what they deliver. We have to rethink our policies that haven't worked in the last decade. And ultimately, we have to step out of a mindset and an ideology that belongs in a different era. None of this is easy. These are tough decisions. That's why it hasn't happened. So instead of talking about real tough reforms, we maybe talk about dreams. We maybe talk about a faster horse. As others on Twitter described it, we maybe talk about Wakanda. <laughs> Fellow South Africans, our nation is in deep crisis. And I believe we can turn it around if we're willing to act now and make decisive choices. We can begin by building a modernized African country comprised of strong individuals who are able to compete with the best in the world. Babu Abare, the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The second best time to plant a tree is today. We need to plant the trees for the future of our children, knowing that we ourselves may never sit under those trees, but we must plant them today. And therefore, fellow South Africans, I want to propose seven reforms that will enable us to become the modern, inclusive country we all dream of. The first reform that we must have is a reform to our state-owned enterprises. The last thing we need now is to be committing ourselves and billions of rand of decades to decades of this dinosaur called ESCOM. We must immediately split ESCOM into two entities and have one company for distribution and another for build. We must allow independent power producers to come on board. Our country is rich in solar, and if we get this right, what independent power producers and solar will do to ESCOM will be what Uber has already done to transport. It will bring change, the change that we need. When we build new green economies, we can allow for workers to be reskilled and be re-included in an economy of the future. We need to allow cities to buy energy directly from independent power producers and stop ourselves from being coal dependent in the next 10 years. We need change and we need reform now. And while we're at it, Mr. President, I hope you can be bold enough to sell SAA and focus that money on fixing the trains that we need. The second reform I want to propose is I want to propose a reform to our education. Fellow South Africans, we have to introduce charter schools. What charter schools are are a private-public partnership that allows for our children to be able to walk to schools closer to them that can give them a quality of education that is private school compared. It will make sure we stand up to unions and give the best teachers the best infrastructure and technology for kids closest to our communities. So that teaching our kids to code and to analyze is not a luxury for a few, but it is a luxury for all our children in South Africa, whether rural or urban. We need reform and we need it now. The third reform I want to propose, Mr. President, is to our health care. What remains true is that you might pursue the national health insurance. It is expensive, it is unaffordable. In truth, it will waste further resources and time in an unrealistic pipe dream for which we simply can't afford. 
So I would propose that our DA's health plan, which gives, in fact, a range of solutions that will make quality health care available for all our citizens, so that whether you are rich or poor, you can gain access to primary health care in both public and private health care facilities. This solution will provide access to free primary health care to be rolled out quicker, cheaper, and more freely. We must also use healthcare technology because this is the future of disease management. Fourthly, we must reform our labor legislation. Mr. President, if we want to be true, we no longer are the investment destination of choice because of our rigorous labor legislation. Our current rigid legislation has not only driven away investment, it's also created two classes of citizens, the employed and the unemployed. So I am urging, let's look at the tax structure and introduce tax incentives for people who create jobs and set up a jobs and justice fund so that we can invest in research and design so that we focus on industries of the future. Let's relook at the national minimum wage in its current form and allow for sector-specific minimum wages and, in fact, give young people opt-out clauses so that they can participate in the economy. The fifth reform is that Mr. we have to President, build a capable and a clean state. I want to state. ask you, let's allow the public I find it shocking to do her job. Or we come Tell here the report into in Parliament into after the revelations of the Zondo Commission have confirmed one thing, where you can come and, and through CADA deployment and, and monopoly politics, let's get we've ended up with state capture. In truth, the deployments today. that have taken place in government, in SOEs or Chapter 9 institutions, state, we should have, have resulted in one thing. Smaller where cadres put the interests of the party instead of the interests of the citizens first. Deputy ministers double them up. It I is deeply worrying that, that there are people who are going to be chairing committees that frankly should be in jail rather than chairing committees. For the people of this country. Mr. President, the sixth reform I want, I want to, to ask you is in fact that we must let's allow the public protector to, to do her job to Our table the report into allegations into Basasa. In let's set up a parliamentary ad hoc committee where you can come and give your version of the story. The right and let's stop delaying. Right let's get to the so bottom of this and, and clean out corruption once and for all in South Africa today. If we are going to reform the state, we should have made cabinet much smaller. Instead, the president made it look as if he's cutting cabinet, introduced deputy ministers, doubled them up. I want to argue this case that we can reduce the state to 15 ministries, eradicate deputy ministers, and make sure money is available for the people of this country. The seventh reform I want to say, Mr. President. The sixth reform I want to table is in fact that we must extend property ownership to millions of dispossessed South Africans. Our history is such that too many were dispossessed in both urban and rural. Therefore, let's give our citizens the privilege of being able to own the right to own title. The right so that black and white South Africans must be able to access the benefit of owning private property as an economic asset that allows them to transfer wealth to future generations. While we add it, let's give shareholding to younger South Africans so that they can transfer wealth so that one day we can say we did break the plan the back of an apartheid plan where our people cannot transfer wealth from one generation to the next. The seventh reform I want to say, Mr. President, is that if we want to keep South Africans safe in, at home, in rural communities, on farms, let us give the South African police into a well-run, well-trained, highly professional crime-fighting crime units let us give this to the hands the of the government in the Africa, provinces. Let us reform policing so that Lagos provinces can run it. Hand them over to provincial Africa governments. In terms Fellow South Africans, if we reform, we can begin a way to the future of South Africa. Ten years from now, I want to see a South Africa that looks completely different from today. We can have unemployment. DA governments are already forging ahead and have begun innovating, modernizing, and growing cities. That's where you govern, where we govern, you'll find unemployment is the lowest in the country due to our obsessive focus on city lay. Today, Stellenbosch has already got an ecosystem in the most productive in Africa, employing over 40,000 people, more than Lagos, more than Nairobi combined rightly earning the title of Africa's tech hub. 
In terms of renewable energy, eight out of ten municipalities in the Western Cape have already got laws in place for independent solar energy generation. And most of them want to sell energy back to the grid. This is what a city-led economic growth plan would look like. That's why we are taking this government to court to ask that they must give the rights to the city of Cape Town to be able to generate energy for citizens here. And we will do it to all the cities. In terms of education, the Deer Run Western Cape investment into the future of e-learning has already seen over 1.4 billion rands invested in the past five years. It's already delivered over 1,160 refreshed computer labs, 28,870 28, devices for learners, and 11,000 resources for our online portal. To date, 70% of all teachers are trained in e-training, and over 80% of the schools are connected to free internet. The Western Cape's retention rate from grade 10 to 12 is the highest in the country. And in healthcare, already we know that more of our citizens are connected online, and we keep 13 million of, our, of, of citizens online records to make sure we give effective health care. Fellow South Africans, we've already started working. Haribui fair. We are working. So I want to appeal to you, Mr. President. I want to appeal to all South Africans. Let's work together to achieve this plan. I have pledged my support to assist in you when you've needed support, when you build South Africa. I want to ask you to help the places where the DA is in government so that we can continue the work that we have. I would urge you, Mr. President, let us free up small businesses to create work. Let us sell off our beleaguered SOEs. Let us modernize and de-unionize our children's basic education. We have a plan, and let's begin to work on it. I want to say this, every single day in this country, I draw inspiration from the teacher who shows up in the classroom despite what is happening. I draw inspiration from the healthcare worker who goes to a hospital. I draw inspiration from the businessman who even when confronted with profit and profit losses still keeps people employed. And in this month, I think we need to draw, uh, draw inspiration from the young people of 1976. When they looked out and they realized that they could not spend their days dreaming, they decided to take to the streets and fight for what is rightfully theirs. Mr. President, time for talking is over. It thank is time you, for us to act right now. I thank you very much. Relevant.